Thank you, Eileen. Ladies and gentlemen, our winner, Mr. Michael Thomas. Dear Eve, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a tendency to be somewhat cavalier, um, and, uh, but I'm a bit frozen right now. I smugly said, well, I teach in front of students, and uh, you know, I can handle that. So uh, forgive, forgive me if I fumble a bit up here, just kind of go into a stupor. Um, uh, but, and also, please don't be uh, insulted by my uh, Gaelic. It's not my native. <laughs> or second or even third language. Uh, perhaps the reason I try to speak it has to do with my family's history, our, our origins, mythic and real. But I've always felt Ireland's influence and been drawn to its history and culture. And looking back, I understand. Joyce and Yeats were two of my first literary heroes, and Van Morrison was almost as good as Otis Redding <laughs> and Marvin Gaye. Uh, in, in my memory, uh, although separated by more than half a century and thousands of miles, the streets of my Boston were like those of Joyce's, du Joyce's Dublin and Araby. I never smelled those ash pits, and I never heard the music shake from the horse's harness. But there were lanterns and careers of play in the sharp, darkening air. And there was an older sister, like Mangan's, who, standing atop her porch, seemed to glow. Uh, my best friend is here tonight. Um, I can't look over there because I might start weeping uncontrollably. He's down from cabin with his father. And I've always wondered what it would be like, you know, although perhaps he's more of a direct descendant than I, you know, two sons returning home. So I'd like the, the people to thank the people who brought me here. Um, the Lord Mayor, thank you. Um, the Honorable e Eugene Sullivan, um, uh, Christopher Houghton, Eileen Hendrick, Sinead Matthews, um, Gay Mitchell, um, Deirdre King, uh, Mr. Robert um, Jacobson, um, and Mary Murphy. I'm not sure where she is, but she's guided me through all of this um, and kept me reasonably calm somehow, some kind of spell. Um, and I'd like to thank the nominating library of Barbados. Um, I can't explain. Um, and all the judges, uh, thank you. Um, and I'm and everybody who's responsible for this uh, night and who've walked me through this um, and kept me from stumbling so much. Um, my mother used to call me a strange boy. <laughs> it, not in a derogatory manner, though, uh, Mom. <laughs> She'd ask me, where are you? And I must have been somewhere. Her stance and her expressions, leaning forward and her head tilted to one side, a raised eyebrow. And I, th I used to think that maybe she'd ask me more than once um, because I'd be somewhere, you know, and I'd come back to this place and I'd be un unable to answer. And for years I couldn't, but I knew I was somewhere, someplace. And Bob Dylan sang about it and Dr. Seuss wrote about it. And one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, you know, all those images and places and characters. And, you know, and some are very, very bad, my favorite picture in that. If you haven't read it, go read it you know, tomorrow. Um, it's a quick read. <laughs> but I didn't have the language to articulate to anyone where I'd been and what I'd seen, especially my mother, who must have been worried looking down at her vacant boy. And uh, later, much later, there are going to be a lot of quotes, so I'll just go like this. Of course, it's Faulkner. Later, much later in the larger world, the blankness would serve me well and also hinder me. Because people could mistake it for poise, or people could make a mistake of her deep concentration when I was really just spacing out or shyness, or arrogance. Um, but I couldn't explain to her or anyone else about being here and there and everywhere, elsewhere. And I was frightened, and I was lonely, transitioning between those two worlds. It's like passing through some local event horizon and you know, into some black hole. So most of the time, I found, found myself balancing on the borderline. But then I started reading, and the authors and their characters were there. But perhaps not the same world as mine, but certainly in their own. On their own. Keats was with his nightingale. Melville was out at sea. Yeats in his radical innocence. Daedalus walking along the strand. And that place, Tirnanug, right, the land of eternal youth, the invisible world, 
Under the rolling hills, inside the trees of the dark wood, the grains of sand on the windy beach, and among the gray-green, green-white, white-silver swells, or in the city, in that fraction of sky between the towers, above the clatter of the horns. And discovering eternal youth, strangely, is a coming of age, or was a coming of age, and I began to meet people who have their own places and learn to speak together. We tried to take care of each other, keeping each other young and free, and part of this care was writing. Um, I don't mean to hyperbolize, but sharing something you make with others is like standing naked. It's your choice, though, how you offer yourself to them defiantly as though before the bar or meekly as for the first time in love or in supplication even. But whatever the case, for me, I was no longer lonely or embarrassed or ashamed of the places I went in my mind. Those amorphous thoughts and the foreign tongue longings I used to have. I thought I found my place and writing was a way of being in this world. And, having a place and having a people. Um, but the world kept encroaching, and it was black and poor, and in the United States of America, and like those who came before me, I was bound to a struggle, and my waking world was the American racial nightmare. But then I found Baldwin and Ellison. I, I thought I could negotiate the two, um, but something happened as I got older. I, I seemed to lose track of that world, or I spent more time in this world, or, became a bit cynical, perhaps a little too early, um, and lost that radical innocence. And I started to become more attuned to the crippling effect of a life spent in art or pursuing art, even though at a young age I said I wanted to be that. But in an older, when I got older, I became aware of the cost. Uh, and I started to sense that, like Elliot, I was living among the breakage and what this life had cost me, and worse, uh, what it cost the people I love. And uh, even up to recently, I began asking, you know, is it worth it on any scale or any level? No. And so over the years, I've gone in and out, mostly out, except for certain moments, you know, singing to my daughter, uh, Mr. Tambourine Man, you know, or uh, listening to my uh, middle child, Miles, talk about the secret life and history of Wales or driving my oldest on Long Island Expressway at dusk, listening to Van Morrison into the mystic, you know, and hearing that foghorn whistle and wanting to go with it. Um, but it was more than race and it's more than class. It, even if I was out without a nation or a race or a religion or a class or couldn't claim any identity other than an artist, I, I feel in some way I uh, failed or I rejected the awe and the wonder and the joy, the honor, and the c connection to this world. The, the one I share with you now, so my people. So now I'm here and there and everywhere or elsewhere. Um, so I'm sorry um, to anyone for being cynical ever, um, although this might be a cynical apology considering, you know, the amount of the war. Please, <laughs> you know, awful marriage of art and, and money. I'm too high-minded for that, yeah. And I want to thank the people who reminded me, and keep reminding me that um, art is an antidote to cynicism. You know, it keeps us not in thought, uh, not in body, sorry, but in thought and spirit, in mind, uh, young. So the people, Patrick, um, my friend, Eilish, Elizabeth, Anankara, and my wife, Michael, Mokishle, um, thank you.